assembled a panel today who covers the business from all different aspects. And uh, to kick things off, I'll let them introduce themselves, starting with Richard. Uh, Richard Sussman from Nielsen Net Readings, um, Director of Media and Entertainment, uh, for Strategic Analysis uh, for Companies, Digital Strategy, etc. Jay Allison, the founder and CEO of Revision 3 and DIG. Um, Revision 3 is an internet television network. Um, John D. from, from Endemol, who's the same on the panel, perhaps the big company you've never heard of, but we're a big TV production company. Um, so we'll get, get into that later. I'm Scott Roche from Adam Films. And we're a broadband network for uh, film and animation from uh, talented amateur and indie creators. Robert Aiken from Associated Press. Um, we are a not-for-profit news cooperative. Um, sort of odd that uh, AP would be on an online video advertising uh, panel, but uh, we recently moved into the online video space with our online video network, which is full gas supported. And I'll be your moderator, Steve Condon. Uh, I'm with Intrigue, and we help uh, companies, media companies, securely monetize their content over mobile, broadband, and IPTV platforms. Uh, to kick things off, we're going to kick off with a bit of research. Uh, Richard prepared a presentation which is going to uh, just give some highlights of what's going on with um, online video at this point in time. Good morning. Uh, this is going to be about three hours long, so <laughs> well situated over there. Um, it's going to be a few minutes. Basically, uh, it's the state of the internet in regards to video. Uh, it's pretty apropos in regards to what's happening. Um, so what's going on with the internet these days? Pretty simply put, users and more usage. Um, what you can see here, and this is from 2006 versus 2005, um, you are looking at an increase in unique audience of 6.9%, web page views 15.3%, total minutes 8.7%, session per person 1.3, web page per person 7.4, time per person 1.7. Across the board, you're seeing an increase, uh, which is wonderful for anybody that's in the market space. Uh, obviously, that would equal to more advertising revenue, hopefully for some of you. Um, broadband is more prevalent. Uh, most of this is intuitive for some, um, but we'll go through this anyway. You're looking at almost 75% penetration of online users that use broadband today. And what does that mean? It means for companies like Endemol and other uh, content uh, producers and uh, production companies out there, more content for the internet. And obviously that means more revenue once again. Online streaming has exploded, uh, obviously, with YouTube and Google in the marketplace right now. Um, some people are shocked. Some people think it's uh, a big mistake. Other people have their own opinions on that. But here's some basic stats on, or some information on uh, online streaming. There's YouTube up there. Um, this is from August 2006. And you're looking at above, well, around about 35 million users for YouTube alone. MySpace videos, um, expect that to increase substantially, but um, they're around uh, 17, 18 million. <coughs> and there's Google Video, um, slightly below MySpace over there. And you're looking at around 14 million users. So um, each one could guess, that just from this stat alone, you may say, well, is it a good move for Google to acquire YouTube? Um, downloaded content is also completely uh, risen over the last year. If you look at September 05, and this is for iTunes users, um, you're looking at around 10 million users for iTunes in the September month of 05, whereas in September 06, it's more than double. Um, and that is from anything from downloading content. Um, some of it is streaming content, but most of it is downloaded content. The market size estimate for iTunes, and this is uh, some information from the last 30 days. Um, this is the online population, 56.9% of the internet population, which equates to about 46.2% use iTunes in the last 30 days. And that's the female population. Male population, which accounts for about 43.1% of the online population, 
53.8 used iTunes in the last 30 days. What's fascinating are the two um, pieces of information below in green. 18 to 34 year olds, which accounts 24.8% of the online population, equals to about 43.2% use iTunes in the last 30 days. And the last step, excuse me, last step there, 18 to 54 year olds account with 73.6%. And if you look at the percentage, that's substantially uh, much higher, obviously, and it's very impressive, which shows that you cannot rule out the elderly or the baby boomers, those uh, above 34 years of age. So size of the US online market, percentage of those streams in the last 30 days. Those that watch streaming video in the last 30 days, online population is around 25.3 million. The online percentage composition is obviously 100% there. But the total online index is 396. So those that have content, whether you are a production company, whether you are a producer of some sort of content and you syndicate it, um, the demographic is extremely high when you look at an index. So when advertisers come to you and they say, what is your index for online streamers on your website? Most likely you get a very high index, with it, which is what they want to see, which increases your CPM value or CPC value of the content itself. <coughs> Um, some of you may be familiar with the Aplan product, but this is a, a survey question taken from that product. And um, we're looking at those that actually uh, used any type of streaming audio or video in the last 30 days. And the first one is for streaming audio. 2005 is 24.4% versus 2006, 35.9%, which is a 47% increase year over year. It's substantial. Um, Watch or download online video, 18.15%, and that's 2005, versus 2006, 25.28%, 39% year over year increase. Some people can say that's pretty impressive. Uh, projected audience category. Uh, I pulled a few different uh, companies here that have been in the news lately. Uh, Groper, I don't know if it should be up there or not. Some people may want it there or not, but that's up to you. Google Video, MySpace Video, YouTube are pretty much the most prevalent here to look at. Um, instead of going back to September 05, um, it made more sense to start off in January 06 for obvious reasons here, because it's no data in September 05 for some of these companies. Um, but if you look at the increase from January for Google Video, where you have 5 million and then increase to 16 million, that's substantial, and that's in less than a year. And then MySpace, 115,000 users in January 6 to over 10 million. And then YouTube, almost 5 million to 27 million. And the total video category, you're looking at 39 million. If you take this to the next level, um, if you can include all these companies and every other company out there that has streaming content online, you're looking at almost 120 million. In August, excuse me, in August. September it declined a little bit. Uh, there's various reasons for that. One, for example, is a uh, major promotion in the summer, July and August, for the uh, new season's shows. Um, so that may have uh, decreased the, the number there. <coughs> and uh, this is interesting because it's sum of total uh, time here per person. And you're looking at Google Video in September 06, 7.1 minutes. MySpace 2.7, look at YouTube, 33.8%. That is another reason why some would guess that Google bought YouTube, time spent. Here's the summary of time per person in minutes. And um, YouTube just overreaches um, the average in the industry. It's unbelievable the time spent that they have over there, especially in comparison to total video category. And you can see some of the other companies, such as Google Video, MySpace, that are they're nowhere in comparison to, uh, to YouTube. So that's basically the state of the internet in regards to video. Obviously, there's a lot more information there, but I thought it'd be a good idea to kick this off with some of the data. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Very impressive growth numbers. The reach numbers are starting to become very uh, significant as well. So when do we think that we're going to start to see um, national advertisers take this medium uh, seriously and get involved and jump in with both feet? Rob, let's start off with you. 
Um, well, for us, it's, it started already. We have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we launched the online video network uh, March of this year, um, purely sponsored by online advertising. Um, we partnership with MSN, and they're handling national sales and technology. And uh, AP um, historically has not jumped on the bandwagon um, early on, nor has uh, nor have our members. So radio, TV stations, newspapers, and so we see this as um, well, we see it's here. It, it's here now, um, and uh, we sort of want to ride the wave up. Um, you know, we think it has a long way to go. It's primarily pre-roll now, but um, you know, they, there's uh, just a opportunity on the horizon. Uh, we've been selling online video advertising since well before anybody wanted it in 2000. Uh, and I can tell you that, that demand is here now. I have films uh, at five or six million weeks a month is selling out the online video inventory consistently to major advertisers in the mobile technology entertainment space. Um, a, a second data point, you know, going, we've recently been acquired by MTV Networks, and I can tell you that in the integration with the company, I've, I've uh, seen a lot of statistics on, on ad demand that, uh, that uh, you know, Combi Centrals and Spike TV and VH1s of the world are seeing. And, and uh, they're, they're running into the same issues. They, they cannot make online video inventory fast enough to keep up with advertiser demand. So it's a, it's a great time to be in this business. Um. So I think to, to echo, echo the point of the other two guys, we definitely see there's a need for, for more inventory. And I think our position as a production company, so just to finish what I was saying earlier, Endemol is a big Dutch company, so we do shows like Big Brother and Fear Faction, Extreme Makeover, Big Home Video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we've been in discussions the last year or so with a lot of these, uh, of the online companies who are now reaching the stage where they need more inventory. Um, and they're looking to us, I think, as, as producers to start creating unique content to differentiate their, their offerings. Um, so we, we've got shows now in pre-production will be coming out next year, so I think that's definitely a demand really goes beyond the basic advertising, and the companies have enough money to fund additional shows which are you know, supported by an advertising model behind them. So we, we, we see it healthy for 2007. Um, at Revision 3, frankly, I think something something must have happened uh, in 2006, around Q2, beginning of Q2. What we saw was this uh, acceptance and, and budgeting process where advertisers who, frankly, had never heard of podcasting, never heard of streaming video, or, or even if they had heard of them, they were strictly focused on traditional creative, um, suddenly <coughs> began to call. Uh, and, and it was that issue that you've heard already about not having enough inventory to support the load. I mean, at this point, not only do we not have enough inventory to support, to support the interest, but we don't have an ad sales department large enough to take the orders. And so we're really in this position of trying to, you know, if it's a market is booming much faster than, than we're even able to scale. Um, from our standpoint, um, especially my personal standpoint, being um, in the business of working with media companies and uh, studios here in Los Angeles and elsewhere, um, we have heard a a request for the last year, and that is we need to track video much better. Um, the demand is so high that advertisers want to know more granular detail, such as demographics of those watching, uh, time spent, abandonment issues of the video, when did somebody start the video, why did they stop the video, and so forth and so on. Um, that that uh, request has been um, a, a general request across the board. To, to be blunt, um, whether it's a very large studio or a small production company, they need to be able to provide the advertisers much better information in order to increase the value of that content online. Um, is, it, is it a fluke what's going on right now? Absolutely not. This is just the beginning of something wonderful from our perspective for, for those that are in this business. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about how we are addressing that, that need to enable companies to maximize their content much better. Okay, so let's say top level for a minute before drilling down. But, okay, so it sounds like it's a good problem to have. Everyone tends to be in consensus that the, uh, uh, the issue is that advertisers do see that this is the next uh, way to reach consumers as far as having an impact. The problem seems to be lack of inventory out there uh, to participate aggressively. But 
What are some of the other issues that advertisers are facing beyond just, you, you highlighted one was the reporting, um, but what about this issue of the formats that are available for advertisers to play in it? And, and, and also, what, why are they so interested in this as, a, as, as an advertising format? I'll, I'll kick off with that. I think the, the issue of quality of content, um, so the guys at Anthem, I think so for years, have been creating quality content, which I think is interesting to advertisers. And some of the challenges in the industry, there's a lot of short form stuff, people stick with scissors in their arm and running around and that type of stuff. But for, for advertisers, that's a little bit dangerous to, to get involved. So I think what we're seeing, there are, there are some quality sites where there's quality content being produced. We see the next wave to incite the advertisers to get involved will be high quality sort of produced, um, taking the best or, or more editorial approach to the to the presentation to the consumer, which then is easier for an advertiser to wrap their, their hands around. So I think if that can, can happen with um, online companies and sort of portals working with content producers, that can be a nice lift. Um, because what we're afraid of um, from the production side is that people get bored or users get bored with uh, sort of short form, very viral stuff. Um, and now they're spending lots of time on there, it's the curiosity that's feeding the, the interest. We want to tap that interest and then sort of migrate them to, to high quality offerings. I think there's a, a move, the Venice Project guys are now starting to do their press, which we think is very interesting and, and uh, you know, they will be, will be working with. So that's more of a programmed environment, which is high, focus again on the high quality to feed people's uh, interest in high quality programming. Um, I'll just speak to the, the standardization issue. I mean, what, one of the, one of the uh, interesting pieces that comes to us is you know the, the advertiser who says, teach me how to play in this medium. He's asking the content provider, you know, as opposed to the distribution network, right? Because remember, they were, we're talking about two different groups that have to interact with advertisers. There are some folks that, that make their money as a distributor who are then going to you know, insert pre-roll, and then there's content providers who integrate advertising like us. Right? In both cases, we're being asked to educate this market in real time, you know, paint the jet while it's flying, so to speak, and it's hard to do because the um, because the nature of the audience is different than television. Um, the the first of all, the attention span, their expectation for like a thirty second spot, just doesn't exist. If you do that, particularly in a very niche targeted type of content, you'll lose your audience. And so then you have to figure out well, what are the other formats, product placement, Ed Sullivan style, whatever you're doing, that can bring that you know advertiser in. This is new. It's sort of interesting that the inventory for advertising online is in huge demand, but it seems that the inventory that they're buying is like a traditional cost per thousand model. And but whereas I think what the opportunity is is for more integrated plays for different formats of advertising and you know who's providing those different formats for advertising and uh, you know what are some of the models out there for rather than the traditional pre-roll 30 second spot for a for a uh, for a, some online video what are some of the other innovative ways that uh, some of your companies or other, others you've seen uh, trying to sell advertising to um, advertisers who want to get online. Well, the, the, the thing that's really uh, hot right now is uh, finding ways to integrate advertisers into a user-generated content experience in a way that protects their brand. So this is a difficult kind it's scary. of scary, <laughs> kind of slippery <laughs> slope because you know it's yeah I want to be in that dynamic kind of free for all that's creating all this buzz and and uh, it, you know has the kind of growth curves that, that we saw in the PowerPoint earlier. But at the same time, I don't want users to do anything negative involving my brand. Well, that's a, that's a tough sell. Um, we've actually spun off a, a, a sister site to Adam Films, um, a user-generated site, and we've been using it as kind of a sandbox to play with some of these issues. And, and you know, pre-roll advertising is not going to work too well in that format, and that's why you're not seeing it on YouTube or on Google Video. Um, some of the things that are interesting, though, I think are uh, uh, sponsorships that enable brands to come in and kind of moderate or curate some user-generated content activity. And, hey, go out and create a, a, a video about this. We've had programs with Altel and an upcoming one with T-Mobile. 
that uh, kind of allow users to play with their brand identity in, a, in sort of a fun way. And actually, I've had pretty good response from users on that so far. Some of the other... The How do you charge for that? Is it a it's, it's actually a, so there's a, a sponsorship fee. It's a hybrid of a sponsorship fee plus a CPM model. So there are adjuncts that go with that. And, and yeah, you do need, need to be able to provide some reach in protected areas of these user-generated content sites. And, and that, that can be done. Um, and some other, additionally, there's some kind of hybrid units that are coming up. So you, you're not really going to, I don't think anybody's going to do pre-rolls on these sites anytime soon, but we're all going to be doing kind of interactive video overlays. You know, you're going to see somebody's logo um, appear as a bug and go across the screen while you're watching the guy run around with scissors in his arm. Um, you're not going to wait. You're not going to wait. You know, wait 30 seconds for a Clorox head to be on that. So it's an. So from our perspective in the industry, we're able to kind of play with these user-generated content ideas on our, on our this spin-off site called Addicting Clips. On Adam Films, um, we are uh, taking a slightly more traditional approach where we're, um, you know, we're accepting user-generated content but with a heavy filter, and we're actually putting out. We're, we're licensing and developing um, what we feel is quality content that, that, that uh, um, provides the experience. Um, I just want to add one thing to that. The, um, the advertisers are asking for pre-roll, right? So there's a, there's a lot of new, as the, as the advertisers, the new advertisers are walking into this for the first time. We're getting lots of orders for pre-roll. We, we don't do pre-roll right now. Um, the experienced ones- it's, it's easy for them, right? It's very simple. Also, they can go through these you know, web ad sales reps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can sort of take their web advertising division and somehow channel it a little bit. Uh, but the, um, but the, only the question is effective advertising, right? Because ultimately that's the one that's going to keep coming back. And so the really experienced folks with podcasting, for example, folks like GoDaddy, who's a sponsor of stuff we do, you know, they'll tell you flat out that the pre-roll doesn't work for them. And so they stop doing it as an advertiser. And so this is an evolution I think you're going to see over the next couple of years is moving away from that vehicle. Just so another note uh, to dovetail that. Um, we're finding that agencies are coming to us often, um, even publishers for that matter, asking for ad effects in the studies of such campaigns. Um, they need to validate that this actually is working. Um, where the dollars ultimately being spent after the advertisement's been placed. Um, I'll give you some fanciful uh, examples, but I'll save that for another time. Um, but the cross behavior is a big issue that we're finding advertisers asking us about. TV viewers versus internet viewers, etc. And um, I'll get into that in a little bit, but the advertising agencies today are wanting to know how do they best allocate those ad spends versus TV versus internet, etc. And if they do, what's the result? And obviously, that's where we come in um, to try and provide some metrics to all that, so it makes sense. Um, but it's, it's an interesting uh, situation right now. It's all new. It's new for everybody. So, what sort of metrics are you looking at? Is it you know, is, uh, are you applying a higher standard to this broadband video online advertising than what's been uh, traditionally the standard that's been applied to television advertising? Um, interesting question. Uh, this. I can talk about it now because we just launched it a few weeks ago. We, together with Nielsen uh, Media Research, they're the ones that do the uh, TV and uh, film ratings, we've come out with a fusion product that basically allows you to understand behavior between cross-platforms, TV and the internet, what I just mentioned before. So um, with this in the marketplace and other things that I could talk about, we are able to find out the demographics of those that are watching TV and those that are actually watching the content online. Now, as we all know, the internet's most trackable medium out there. So if you just take that a step further with granularity, you could actually start looking at the psychographic behavior. So maybe one uh, segment of the audience may be prone to buy movie tickets online, where another one might be prone to buying Nikes. And it all may stem from a commercial that they watched or a TV show that they watched, but simultaneously, they're also clicking online. How do you track all that? And how do you monetize that data? And that's where we've come in with NMR, but it's called a data fusion uh, product. And we're actually taking the television uh, data from that uh, Nielsen Media panel and our panels online and fusing that data together so the advertiser or publishers themselves literally have a 360 degree view to go out there and, and sell more so than they've done before because now they have granularity to the numbers. Now this is new, 
Um, it's new for everybody, including ourselves. So we are hoping that this becomes a standard in the industry. Cross platforms, especially with mobile coming uh, for us in about a year uh, to this product, we need to be able to track that much better. And if we can, it validates your numbers, which helps you advertise uh, double So I think another angle to it um, in Rich's position, and uh, it's very, very important to connect the dots. So another panel the other day talking about mobile advertising, and one of the advertising guys are all for my clients and to be metrics and the board, you know, otherwise we can't get involved and blah, blah, blah. So I think that there is still, any advertisers here, by the way? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, one, 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 one. one. <laughs> so I think bridging those two worlds, they are very, very different. Um, and it's not a, you know, it's always this video that's watching around the time and you have to understand video and kind of the two meld together. So what we've been finding, we, we do outside the US in our, in our businesses, we have more restrictions on um, sort of product placement, et cetera, et cetera. And that's like a shoe makeover over here, there's a high degree of product placement, which is one way to attack it. But in other countries, we'll do um, sort of advertiser funded content, so we're used to doing that around the world. So we're seeing that's quite attractive now to, to brands. And we're, we're even being asked, the whole user generated um, trend, we're being asked, can you produce something in the style of user generated? <laughs> okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, you know, so can you do a really low It's a style. Or, it's a style, which is really interesting. Just um, like the scissors in your arm. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and it's, it's, it's not just bad, it's a style. Yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is bizarre. So I think addressing, like, we have one of our formats called uh, Cellular, um, which is a uh, started in France and rolling out in different countries, which is a, a few girls and a, and a guy, and they, they exist their whole life on the phones. So it's sort of all about their conversations. So that one's obviously a natural for, for cell phone carriers, because it's nice that you get it out there and they do it the messages or the product. So I think a blend of the two, the guys on the panel being creative and certainly educated, but I don't see that happening. Maybe you guys do, like Q1 and 07. It's a slow process, because at the moment I watch, uh, you know, with our network partners, uh, anyone watches Heroes? No, <coughs> yeah, <good>. So, <laughs> so the, the, the online versions, if you go and, and look, I think another challenge with the, the pre-roll is because there's limited, a lot of the car companies are experimenting. Um, and within Heroes, I watch the same, like Ford or whatever one, every single break. It's like by the end of it, I was more turned against, you know, from Ford, more turned against the brand than I was interested. So I think varying the, the inventory and making the experience uh, uh, compelling is, uh, is, is not there yet. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, we seem to be going backward in, um, in the television programming, back to the early days of television where uh, advertisers were very integrated with programming. That trend seems to be coming back. We're seeing on The Apprentice, you know, in, in, in show sponsorships. Uh, I, I wonder if the internet, with the explosion of internet video is going to accelerate that trend in many ways as brand, true brand advertisers really try and understand how they can extend their brand and become a more, make them more entertaining. Internet can play a huge role in that. I think, you know, integrated brand entertainment is, you know, a, a huge trend and it's obviously, uh, you know, in the early days of television, as you mentioned, it, it has proven its value and I think it's going to be one way that, that brands reach their audience online. But, you know, I think pre-rolls, I'm going to say some words in defense of pre-rolls here. Um, because, you know, they, 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 while they certainly have problems, you know, frequency capping, you don't want to see the same for a commercial over and over again. 30 seconds may be too long. Um, you may not even want to see, you know, the right amount of intrusiveness may not even be seeing one of those in front of every ad. But, I mean, the fact is, the pre-roll is the closest thing advertisers have to this holy grail of, of being able to couple reach. With, uh, with control and the ability to actually track what's going on, but yet have this kind of emotional impact with the audience that they have through the television creative that they you know, spend a god awful amount of money on. And so I think there's gonna be a lot of demand for that. Now, does it, do you lose some of your audience if you, if you hit your wagon too closely to pre-rolls? Yeah, definitely. You know, we, we actually have suffered from that a bit in the past. Um, you know, what would YouTube's audience look like if they had pre-rolls in front of every piece of content and all that they had, you know, the proper IP rights, all that content, the, you know, that growth curve would be much less. There's definitely a trade-off in, in how you operate your business and, and how you grow your, your, your audience. But I think that the real mix of a successful ad-based business is going to involve some pre-roll. It's going to involve some integrated or branded entertainment within the, the actual content itself. And it's going to involve some, some advertiser stunts and contests. And I think we're all kind of experimenting with what, what is the right mix there. And, and, 
you know, what do advertisers like, what do audiences like, and what's that right level of intrusiveness? Because the fact is, if you, if you actually go too far on the branded entertainment side, if somebody's flashing a can of Sprite every 30 seconds in the yeah. so-called plot, um, you know, you're going to lose the audience as well. Another thought is that um, TV buys um, are very different from internet buys. And right now, it's an educational process trying to allow those that buy the TV time to understand that internet's very different with a whole different metrics, you know, CPM, CPC, et cetera. Um, so this cross-media behavior issue is something that they're tackling every single day, and they need to quantify the ad spend. So um, like incremental reach or campaign planning, how do they best go about this? Because it's a whole new world for these, for these guys. Um, so a lot of money, obviously, is coming online right now. And I think it will be fast, as, as you said, it's speeding up. The internet definitely is, is provoking uh, the advertising world to wake up and realize that TV is not the only way to go about this. You know, we could reach our audience probably more effectively with maybe a crossbreed between TV, analytics, as well as internet, or by trying it out with the internet as well. And everybody that has content obviously will benefit from that. Um, as to where they place the advertisements, obviously that is up for debate. And who? And yes, exactly. And, and we've also got to not think about advertising generically. You know, there's brand advertising and there's response generated advertising. And you know, maybe the pre rolls are uh, a very effective response generated advertising, um, something that's to elicit a sale or, or, or a price offer. But you know, for brand advertising, you better to be more integrated. It's something that needs to complement your brand better or something consistent and it's going to add some more value to your brand. And so, you know, be careful just think of advertising as one big mass. They all have different roles. Right? Don't forget CPA. Mm. Uh, I, I, you know, one of the uh, advertisers we work with, large media company advertised one of our shows and didn't have the metrics, didn't know what, what type of advertising would be good for them. First thing they did with us was a promotion where they could track it very directly, you know, Ginsu style. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, it was very effective. It was a tea company that sells tea at Adagio. They, they, you know, put a promotion code. Now, they sell online, so it's easy for them to track themselves, granted. It's different than Nike. but. You know, they sold a hundred thousand dollars in tea in a single episode of two guys sitting on a couch and drinking beer. So they realized that you know there's low risk to get in in that case because they put no money up front. There's no agreement up front. It's just a percentage of revenue share. That kind of that kind of tracking, nothing beats that kind of tracking. Sure. To add to that, from a news perspective, um, we have a different set of, uh, of issues. Um, since we're dealing primarily with breaking news, we can't always control the volume, and therefore its uh, inventory management becomes a, a big issue. Um, earlier last month with the Steve Irwin tragedy, we saw an MSN video, our, our partner saw, um, you know, four million uh, content stream days go to 11 million, and we saw our network jump by 4x. And, um, it's, you know, you, do you really want, you're taking advantage of it in some ways because it is news and we, I don't think anyone predicted how um, popular that video would be or how uh, the, the user interest there. Um, but we didn't have enough inventory. So you're not really taking advantage of the opportunity. So you need to watch out for that. To uh, comment on some of the other uh, points, sponsorships obviously aren't an option. There's a conflict of interest. And um, so what do we do for the future? It's, it's more of the same because it's more pre-roll. It's the ease of use and transferring from the uh, broadcast market to, to online. And uh, we're playing around with diversity of ad advertisers, the length of a spot, and then uh, an ad placement. Maybe it's not an ad, two content streams, and an ad. Maybe it's one 15-second ad, and then based on one and a half or two minutes of uh, content, then we uh, introduce another. Um, and then on the performance base, uh, one of the things we're doing with our, uh, what we call phase two, launched in the beginning of next year, is allowing for our members of radio, TV, newspapers to um, flight their own content. And when they do that, they can sell their own ads against that. And I think that creates an opportunity to mimic what they're doing in the offline world with, um, for instance, newspapers get about 45% of their uh, revenue, or used to get 45% of their revenue from classifieds. Can they do the same sort of thing and have a performance-based uh, add against that local content. So if the local car dealership is, you know, um, showing an advertisement, there needs to be some sort of uh, bi-directional, or could it, there could be some sort of bi-directional 
interactivity between the consumer and the uh, advertiser then. Okay, let's just change the tag a little bit. Um, obviously, the big news is the Google acquisition of YouTube. Um, when do you think that joint conglomerate is going to uh, play a serious role in the upfronts in terms of uh, gathering a sizable share of ad dollars? And do you think that they will uh, play in that market? Um, if they don't do it next year, they're missing an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's about you know how integrated they can become and how fast. Uh, and I just I, I've seen very quick integrations over there, very slow ones. So don't know enough about YouTube's organization to answer that question. Do you think? Do you, well, let's put the question a bit differently. Do you think that? Gucci will end up being a competitor for the networks in the long term. It, it's if you look at the, the charts I showed before, um, it's time spent. If they capture the audience uh, as effectively as YouTube has and then some, um, they're going to be a significant player in this space, no doubt about it. Um, they know how to capture eyeballs. Um, they have um, enough money to support business models failing and still succeeding, like moving forward. So they, they have the ability to literally do a trial and error over the next year. Um, we su suspect that they're going to be a formidable player in this industry, in this space. And the, the comp it, you know, it's competition or cooperation or a little bit of both. You know, a lot of the content that's popular on YouTube is network content. So yeah, I think the networks are looking at YouTube saying, you know, is this, is this an opportunity for us to further monetize the content, or is this a, a situation where we need to make a legal challenge? <laughs> so you see companies, even you know, within the same company, answering that question different ways from week to week, and, and uh, I, I don't think we've, we're near the end of that process. I wonder if there's a possibility that um, YouTube could eventually become like an affiliate for the networks, like they have affiliates at the moment in different markets. I mean, the networks, have traditionally distributed their content to affiliates in markets where those affiliates have strong relationships with the local consumers, strong relationships with local advertisers, and, and are effective at distributing that content locally. YouTube has a very strong presence online, understands their subscribers and, and, and the visitors online, knows how to monitor, so why not use them as an affiliate for their content? I, I, I like to, can I call it Google? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure the, you know, the, the affiliate model, but if, you know, there you've got uh, different technology, but I think the internet's much more of an open landscape. Um, so, so right now, I think there is experimentation on the network side, going, oh, this is good, this is proving my model, <coughs> see how many people are viewing our content, we can invest more in cbs.com, nbc.com, nbc.com, etc. We're going to become the big place where people watch it. They're watching our shows. So I think everyone's watching using this um, a test case. But as soon as it, you know, all the play starts happening on the Google uh, side, I think it definitely is a, is, a, is a threat. And the articles that came out after the broadcasting in favour, etc. A lot of people the networks don't like control switching from their domain. Um, so I think Google has already shown in, in general that they're very much a technology company and come from a different mindset in terms of, of media or ownership, et cetera, with some of the ventures they've done in the past. So no, I think definitely a, a threat um, in terms of eyeballs. And in, in general, sort of the comments we were talking about earlier, I think it's an exciting, exciting time for any you know, students of media as, as all the barriers are now being broken down. So you have you know, huge technology coming in uh, to the market and shaping things up. You've got you know, advertisers going back to the birth again of television. Uh, networks are now not the dominant way where people you know, view, uh, view their content or get entertained. We've got games, I saw the PlayStation 3 last night, which is very cool. Um, coming out to get the whole gaming world is, is, is uh, a huge chunk of time as well. So all these interesting players, and advertisers, or Bug TV, you know, so the advertisers are trying to get in the game as well. So it's, it's a really interesting time uh, for everyone to be, I think, extra creative um, in not throwing out everything they know, but uh, really talking to everyone who probably would never talk to before we go <coughs> to all sorts of companies in the last year, because the production company would have never been our, uh, in our domain, and we work out new relationships and new deals. 
and uh, so we need things in a new direction. I think. Yeah, I mean, the thing I disagree with there, John, is that I, you know, I think Google very much is developed some great technology to attract an audience, but they are effectively a platform platform for advertising. Everything they do is a platform for advertising. It's very much similar to what the networks do. They're a platform for advertising, and so they're very similar business models. And um, so, it's so it's yeah. Yeah. but now we have this disintermediated world where the content provider isn't dependent upon that distribution platform any longer. I, as a content provider, and I, and I know I've heard the same thing from just about every media company out there who's producing content, even the traditional ones, um, they don't want to be hostage to any one player. So when you consider that neutrality issue and you consider the lack of exclusivity, that's where the affiliate model might struggle. That's one piece. And then secondly, the larger percentage that the content provider is going to expect to take in, the, in terms of the take from the advertising, right, is going to change, change the model. So can there be one big exclusive player out there? I don't think so. And I think, you know, frankly, you know, we've been talking about these, these guys. I noticed Apple, you know, it was in your, in your, in your presentation, but they're a contender here. Mm -hmm. Big one. Because Ultimately, people don't like to watch the long format shows in a window on YouTube. They like to watch it on ITV, right? So that's going to have a huge impact on all of this. Um, and I'm not sure Google is in a position today to capitalize on some of those other opportunities. But uh, talking about the affiliate uh, model, um, a good example to watch would be uh, News Corp, MySpace. Um, they are pushing their Fox content nonstop through MySpace, and there's other things that are kind of going to be coming out in the next six months. Um, so this whole model of uh, using a network as an affiliate channel, so to speak, um, is actually in play right now as we speak. Um, we'll see what the results are soon, but uh, it's, it's a great, uh, it's fascinating to watch actually, because uh, Rupert Murdoch bet on this model. Quite, quite a large sum, actually. And uh, to hedge Google's acquisition with uh, YouTube, a few weeks prior, obviously, they did a very large deal with uh, MySpace themselves, because they know that YouTube distributes most of their content through MySpace. MySpace helped YouTube be who they are today. Um, so these are all models that we need to consider. I don't think it's just one model to look at, say, is it right or wrong? I think it may be a hybrid. Look, the key thing that I think needs to be uh, that needs to happen before we really figure out what you know to what degree YouTube is competitive with the media companies is media companies need to get their acts together online. I mean, you mentioned the, the Fox example, and you know Fox is, is working with MySpace, you know, and doing a lot of things other media companies aren't doing. They're comfortable doing that, of course, because they own MySpace. Um, the the fact is, despite you know ABC being somewhat aggressive in the space with their content and and some other experiments here and there, no media company has um, gone very far in terms of making their content widely accessible online um, to the point where it's as accessible and shareable as it is on, on a YouTube. And I think you're going to see the media companies start to experiment with that before they make a decision as to how much they need YouTube. So, you know. Does that mean every piece of content is going to be available simultaneously when it's when it's on television? You know, there are MSO issues, there are affiliate, you know, there are a lot of a lot of things to be unraveled there. But the fact is, there's a lot of content in the vaults of these media companies that, that they can make much more accessible online, and I think they're going to do that before making an ultimate decision on, on where, where they stand vis-a-vis. Oh, they may not need to make a decision either. You know, it's um, the models out there, and it's uh, models out there in traditional retailing. You know, people have. Showcase stores, for example, NBC can have their showcase store of their video content, which is NBC.com or whatever. But they can still make their content available through other other sites, and uh, they have their marquee store. I mean, traditional uh, premium labels have their marquee stores in New York or or on Rodeo Drive, but they still sell their stuff through other stores around the country. I think the same model could. Yeah, you know, I think. Like, yeah, I was going to say, I think that again, the physical and digital is, is difficult to to look side by side. I mean, well, we're a large media company, I suppose, and I'd say with the exception um, to the broadcasters, so we have about 30,000 hours of programming. But over the last year or so, we're now experimenting and doing our deals. We've done our Google deal, we've done our AOL deal, finishing up our Fence deal, and Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. 
to experiment and then we'll also go direct, which is unusual as a, as a content producer because we usually depend on the, the networks for the distribution of our share cable companies. So we launch, we launch a channel on AOL called Lazy TV. We've got sort of, why not? We've got all this uh, catalog of programming, uh, which is interesting for the online audience. So we're now looking to get cable, you know, DOD distribution for it and launch it as a broadband channel with these bright code guys. Um, I um, So I, I think it's it's definitely a, a window, maybe, you know, as opposed to an affiliate. So, to your point with MySpace and, uh, and, and New School, that's all in the same family. So to use the online window as an experiment for testing or promotion or marketing is very interesting if, if it's controlled. But the Google thing's a little bit amorphous in terms of how you can control it and what will happen if you put it in there. And I imagine how much you depend, how much you value those affiliate partners will, in some sense, depend on how successful you are on your own direct channels and, and, and you know, to what degree people are taking your video and embedding it on MySpace from your channel versus others. There's another issue which dictates um, which direction this whole industry is going to go, and that's how we could track it. Uh, bottom line, if you can't track it, uh, you're not going to be able to monetize it, and that's where we've come in. Um, so there's a lot of push right now with digital video audio uh, tracking, where for the first time ever, we've actually taken two of our methodologies, a browser-based tagging methodology, uh, like an armature site census, which is our uh, product, um, and also the panel base, which is what Nielsen Entertainment uses. We use that where you sh uh, have projections on user behavior. And we're actually combining these two methodologies to enable granularity of the, uh, of the tracking. So uh, who is not, uh, who's watching and who's stopping, who's actually abandoning a commercial, where are they abandoning, and then the why, uh, the psychographic behavior behind that. So it takes the guesswork out of all these different models and well, allows you to... And we need you to do it because of trust issues, right? Because we have that right. data ourselves mm -hmm. in the internet world. We know how long they're watching. We actually can put clients out there that they have to, if we wanted to, we force them. Our flash can tell you how long they're watching and how far in mm -hmm. they're going. And we can know a lot about their demographics, but it doesn't matter what we know. What psychographic do you have? Well, exactly. You do have another medium to compare it to. Right. Well, but more importantly, you're independent. Right. And that's what we're really lacking right now, is, is that independent And we're going through auditing right now from the uh, Media Research uh, uh, Council, and we want to bring a transparency to this whole methodology. Um, if advertisers and uh, production companies and networks and, and online entities feel confident in the numbers that are out there, ad spends will increase online in this medium. Okay, so one final question. Let's get back to the advertisers. And uh, which advertisers do you think uh, uh, are going to win in this space at the moment? And which ones are deploying uh, some online ad models that you think are pretty compelling and maybe give some glimpses into what uh, more people will be doing in the future? Um, Rob, down the end, you. You know, what we're seeing right now is. Um, it's so focused on branding that it's the it's the um, you know the larger consumer product group uh, companies uh, and it's it's really tough to tell. Um, again, it's uh, working on, from the news side. It's slightly different than uh, than you know being at out of films or uh, working with uh, Google uh, user generated content. So uh, for us, it remains to be seen. I think the advertisers that are that we see that are most successful are, are the ones that are operating on, on multiple multiple fronts. So you know, um, an example of this would be Verizon. We, we work with Verizon in a number of ways. We're, we've got a channel on their Vcast, but they're also a big advertiser and sponsor on our site. They're they're uh, they'll have significant branding on our site around the relaunch in December. They're sponsoring a new broadband full screen option. There, there's going to be a a Verizon sponsored film user-generated film contests, all of these running in, in different windows within a period of, of a couple of months. And I think that you know, being able to connect the dots between you know, this content online and this content in mobile and, and getting the, the brand in front of consumers in the right context at the right time, they're going to be very successful in that campaign. And that's the kind of thing that, that, that we like to do for advertisers. Uh, I think another one is Karen. I, I think um, in general, any of the advertisers to focus really on the creative. Um, Singular, I think, has been doing some interesting things as well. I mean, you see them on the, the VOD platforms. There's a channel called Bright, 
you know, TV, and they've got some really interesting pre and post and within the show um, online. You know, they've done their, their underground you know, music challenge, which is interesting. So I think any of the brands who realize that large amounts of their audience are on there, and I think the buzzword in the advertising, well, the one advertising guy, they can really put um, engagement. I think to, to, to understand that now it's it's more likely to be created, it's time to be really, really creative to engage and provide value to your potential customers. Um, and there's so many things with the guys on the panel that you can do uh, to engage them. So. Um, I guess the answer to the question for us has been anyone who's been uh, an online presence and also a consumer advertiser on television are the leaders in, in adopting this kind of advertising. Any dot com type name or e commerce company has basically, if you're a big name in that space, you've already been out there trying to buy this advertising on podcasts and on streaming. Um, and they're going to obviously have a big lead in terms of the, the net effect. Uh, but another very important point to qualify that is that remember that it's not apples to apples because on online you're dealing with niche, in depth opportunities that uh, attract a completely different set of advertisers and what is successful in each niche is going to be a different metric than what is going to be successful across the, you know, the, the top five networks. Um, advertisers are faced with a challenge. They used to um, a one-way model TV, basically. And um, there's, there's a belief in our circle, at least, that um, the one-way model works if you want a brand. Uh, if you want a two-way model, combine internet to that, you'll drive sales. And um, that's what advertisers want. They want to drive sales, ultimately. So you take that step further, you have mobile and all the other uh, various portable uh, uh, products out there, um, it, it, gets, it gets even greater. So the, the ability to actually track this is, is here today, which is great news for everybody out there in this space. It's going to validate the numbers that you guys put out there. It's going to bring um, a comprehension to the networks those that are used to the one-way model, and also to advertisers that are trying to figure all this out. So I think, from what I understand, we're all working together, which is wonderful, um, rather than against each other, just to try and monetize it. This is me. Hey, that is interesting. We might we might see a bit of a um, a, re, a revisiting and a regrowth and a reinterest in branding um, with this new medium. I think the companies that, who have a lot of depth to their brands. And so therefore can really exploit them broadly uh, across this new medium. Maybe the ones who really can benefit from it. You know, the BMWs of the world with their short films and, and they, they can tell a story around their brand that's consistent with their brand <coughs> may really have a big opportunity to exploit this new medium and maybe some of the real winners in the end. Uh, if you don't have a depth to your brand, it's going to be a lot more difficult to do things that are consistent with uh, who you are and to really have an impact with that. So, uh, I think one, one additional thing that's important to mention is the power of your other uh, advertising channels to support online. Um, so not seeing them as silos, I think it's a Scott's point as well. I mean, we run this show deal or no deal, um, and the power, I think, of TV has always been a question of TV, would it drive people to, to online or other platforms? We have close to, you know, close to a million people going to the NBC website when we launch the show, we to the, the website, I think we're like 70% of their traffic. So uh, I think a lot of people who watch TV and other channels are willing to check out as well as the whole two screen notion, I'm there with my Wi-Fi, with a laptop, on the couch, watching the TV, and I'll, I'm willing to interact given the right opportunity. So I think leveraging your existing stuff is important as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Okay, the, um, what we've been asked to do is just ask, uh, answer how this will extend out to mobile devices. Well, maybe there was a good panel on Monday night. Um, so I, I, I think in general mobile is, is a little bit of a different, different beast. So the, you've got the three different categories for advertisers for mobile. You know, one is the basic traditional mobile marketing, text messaging. Um, being integrated, so examples of that, again, on deal we work with uh, the Paramount, so when you get the bounce back, it's like, check out the over the hedge DVD, um, and there's a CPM model for, for that, which I think is the biggest opportunity for, for mobile advertising right now. The, the other two areas are uh, banners on the WAP channels, um, 
which is growing, I don't know, maybe $5 billion last year or something like that. Um, but uh, a lot of interest. And then the third one is sort of mobile video, which is the and where we see video, whatever brands, you know, you, if you can extend it to another channel, you have different rights issues, obviously, for the, for the video on, on mobile devices and the devices to get it out. I think that's, again, an interesting one if it's little pre-rolls or branding, similar issues that we've been talking about in the online space. My experience has been, uh, I'd love to hear if anybody's had different experiences, but the, the carriers are, are, have not yet fully embraced um, advertising on their networks. Um, so for example, on, on our VCAST channel, you know, we are not uh, serving or encoding advertising that content. We can, however, in an integrated environment, take a, a film that was created through a, for, for Intel, for example, and, and run that as content. And there's a little bit of a gray area, but that's sort of an example of an early stage way that advertising can, can show up in, in, in that area. And other startups, uh, really networks being one, that, that are working on the, the technical challenges of serving in the mobile space, uh, pre-roll type advertising. And we're looking forward to that, but you know, the, uh, the, the operators and the technology will have to come together right time to really make that a, a scalable opportunity. We, we, uh, we've built the solutions that enable you to do mobile advertising. It's just a matter of the audience out there at the moment, and the yeah. carriers are really integrated. I mean, the, the technical solutions are out there to make you know, pre-roll or integrated advertising work, but it's really a matter of how many people are going to download content to their phone, how many people are out there watching, streaming uh, mobile television at this point in time. Uh, the numbers are fairly limited, but the, you know, the, they'll get there. I mean, uh, with what Qualcomm is doing with their service and others, uh, mm. I think the, the audience is okay. starting to grow up. A good, a good, I mean, another case study, also Sprint, like in the US, is a little bit more progressive in terms of, of advertising. But uh, in the UK, with a company there, we did a, a, a partnership between O2, uh, Nokia, and Universal. So we have a, a format called Get Close to. So that was an interesting youth focused diary show. I mean, we followed this band called Sugar Babes, like a big UK artist. Um, so for O2, it met their needs of meeting the youth audience. We produced a show. Universal wanted to encourage the fact that the girls could actually sing. So having the video work for, for them, and Nokia was trying to promote their N91 device. Um, so the girls were using it to shoot themselves. So sort of everyone won, and that was an advertising, you know, support, an advertiser supported uh, show. And that was like the number one of the, the O2 video charts. It's sort of a different way to tackle it as well. I, I was just going to say, you know, in, I consider iPod video to be uh, an important trendsetter in, in mobile, for me anyway. This is a medium that they have no control whatsoever what advertising I, I integrate in my, in my video. And, uh, and, you know, I can get 300, 350,000 viewers a week today through iTunes alone for one show. That's better than a lot of cable stations have done with niche shows. So, you know, with all due respect to Verizon and Sprint and, and you know, sort of the, the distribution channel forcing the advertising and taking that piece, I can go around it. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Sometimes, you know, you've got to remember mobile is brought in to include devices, but yeah, the iTunes podcasts are, are a great way to get that out there. And to some extent, uh, but there's no iTunes or the PSP yet. <coughs> Uh, that's a, uh, PSP downloads have been a pretty good format for us as well. So, yeah, um, Richard, if you could expand a little, you, you touched briefly on some new modeling techniques that are being put into play so I can start having a little more accountability with the marketing dollars. And if anyone else is hearing anything more about that, that really has been the biggest challenge. You know, it's, it's like YouTube is so broad, you know, who really is seeing that? Mm -hmm. So. I'd love to hear more on that specific subject because that's really the, the more money that's being allocated right now by all the major advertisers, they're going to start demanding results. And so that's going to really affect how we grow as an internet. Just, absolutely. They, they already are demanding results, right. um, and which is wonderful because we have to keep up with technology, obviously, like everybody else. Uh, some people are um, at the forefront of it. But once it's out there, we need to understand it first and then put a uh, system in place that uh, we feel confident in. We're not going to just throw any service out there. We could have thrown out something about a year ago, which would have made people happy, but it would have ultimately caused more confusion to the marketplace. 
So in short, there are two products that um, we have recently launched. One is Data Fusion uh, with NMR, uh, where we're taking the uh, television panel and meshing mesh that data together with our online panels. Um, and we're able to uh, see cross-medium data, psychographic, demographic, uh, click-screen analysis. Um, so it, for cross-promotions for advertisers, you could actually uh, have ad effects in the studies and figure out exactly what dollars were spent and allocated and what were the results. And you could have this pretty fast. Um, That's what I was going to ask. Is it real time? Get ready. Well, real time. Um, it's as real as it could get. I mean, obviously, you have a dashboard telling you the you would have you would have a dashboard. Um, you absolutely would have a dashboard um, that would provide you data. What we call real time, it may be delayed, maybe a little bit. Um, depends on the product. It depends if it's out of effectiveness. If it's out of effectiveness, that will not be real time, obviously. Um, the other service that we um, have put out in the marketplace, and we've done beta tests with a ton of different studios, production companies, um, publishers that are in the uh, content business for the last six months, and we've had tremendous success with this, and that's um, a digital video audio product that, like I said before, mashes together two methodologies that's never been done before, and that is the tagging with the projected panel. Um, so you could actually see side-by-side -side data as to what the uh, behavior is with clickstream granularity. So it takes the guesswork out of the whole equation, and you have psychographic and demographic information. You take that a step further, then you add in the, the, um, the fusion products, you can cross all sorts of mediums, and obviously mobile will be in this space as well in a matter of months. We just have to perfect step-by-step you know, step step on the source. You can feel stupid with one pro guy and you know, a little script that's going to be my output to this. So. Well, it, it's, at least you have that, which is terrific. And that's what the industry is. And that's why advertisers do not feel confident in that data, because number one, it's your data, it's server log data. And as we all know, server logs can skew for various reasons. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, somebody wants to launch a broadband channel. One of the problems that I'm having is obviously you need advertising for your business model in terms of if you're going to make any revenue. But it seems like there's a ton of companies that have just launched, like you were saying, Brightcove, or and maybe you have one, or Narrow Step, or this White Blocks, and, and then you said you launched on AOL. And I can't, and everybody seems to think they've got it down. I want to see more confident people in my life. <laughs> we have got it. We have the advertising seven different point structures and, and this and that. And I can't tell yeah. one from the other, and nobody will tell me the price. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll like, so what does that cost? So, yeah. What are you looking for? Well, I, I, it's a really complicated <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and what you need to do is understand that there's a value chain of the, the, that all these companies provide, and some of them are experts in different areas. And so you need someone to lay it out for you and just say, okay, what do you really need? And get someone who really does that well. Um, if you want to launch your own, own site, and you want to get a, a site up with advertising insertion, and that's your model, you know, Brightcove is a great choice. Very easy to use, very easy to get up and running, and your way, and up, and, and done. And, and they have an ad share revenue model. If speed to market is important to you, Brightcove has a great solution. Yeah. I was going to say, we're in a, I mean, exactly the same, I don't know what sort of company you are, policy company, or? Um, I, I run a Paramount. Oh, okay. Picture. Small company. Small company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. Like it. <laughs> 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 that was awesome. That was great. I was going to get back on that bright thing. Not a big one. I think it's tricky, I think there's a little 
bit of a leap of faith and really to, to, to get it moving. You know, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll eat, you know, the cost of some of the companies that defray the cost in the beginning. In terms of setting up the system, you can become part of the network in exchange for being part of their network or, or, or whatever. Um, and then we've been making aggressive, you know, we have interactions with advertisers, but we're, we're getting much closer to connections to brands and advertisers where they'll say, well, can we sell your advertising? Do you want to sell your advertising? Just to, to speed up your efforts to get closer to the brands and advertisers and, and redefine print in the, in, in the deals. But as they experiment, you know, get out there, and once you have something to show, it's much easier with the conversation with the advertisers or brands saying, well, here it is. Do you want to be a part of it? As opposed to, well, here's an idea we're thinking about. Um, so I have to get in and, and give it a go. Yeah, as, as somebody who's done what you're trying to do with launching an online video channel, my advice would be to you know keep your costs low, go with a, a company like a, a Bright Cove early on, and then as you grow that audience, take a step back and, and look and, and see you know will you have the kind of revenues coming in to invest in doing it direct because it is an investment. You know you need you, if you're actually going to run your own ad sales operation, you've got to be trafficking the ads, you've got to be serving them in addition to actually going out and selling those deals, and it's it's there's some overhead. So in our case. We burned a fair amount of venture capital getting through that leap of faith period where the, uh, the, the revenues justified the operation and we got there, but it is, uh, it is not, uh, it's not easy. And if you really are paranoid, I think the, uh, <laughs> the point is a lot of the companies are coming in and they say, well, we'll sell your advertising with our advertising team. That advertising team is being built as they're pitching. So I think there's an opportunity, depending on the size of your business, to invest, if you can justify it, on a couple of ad guys or, or, or ladies. Um, to start your own efforts. I think everyone's starting at the same time. I, I just don't understand why, why, why you would lock yourself to any one particular platform. What, what is the nature of the contract that makes it impossible to do two or three? I mean, we have done, I mean, I don't you, you guys haven't mentioned, you know, uh, Rever. And, I mean, there's just, there's just I mean, there's, there's no reason why. I need to care. I mean, unless unless bringing people to my own website is mission critical to my success, because remember, if your goal is to get your content out there and sell advertising on that content, is your own website necessarily the key to that? It's key to community. It's key to brand. I, I agree with that. But we focused on being platform neutral, and we can take revenue a million different ways, and you can experiment at zero risk. Yeah, I think the only from, from our perspective, so we had a lazy TV channel. It was just a case we, we did have everywhere, but we thought just in case anyone thinks, oh, lazy TV, I'll go to lazy TV, we should have something there. All right. So that's, that's the only reason I think that. I think that's the only reason I get it at many places. And then when you surf your flash from your home page, you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. if there's somebody who makes it easy for you, sure, you know, yeah. try something easy. But, mm -hmm. but you know, we just, swipe it. <coughs> just download a, you know, a public domain open source flash server and, and do it ourselves. It took us about two days to set up. Not something so. <laughs> uh, With the advent of um, you know, the internet's destroying yeah. all the distribution, sure. the economics needs to exist, and, and it's with the you know, consumer video, consumer podcasting, you know, a lot of the fragment, you know, a lot of fragmentation among the media, you know, people can actually generate content for media. And I get calls from advertisers saying they want to buy you know, advertising on podcasting, but the podcasters are all you know, way too small to actually you know, justify the time of the advertiser to, to do a deal, right? So there's tremendous benefit in advertiser aggregating advertising buys, if you will. Um, but the, the advertisers want to buy along certain you know, demographics or certain you know, content related. You know, they want to buy cooking or they want to buy you know, whatever they want to buy. Do you see a role for the content players in being providing sort of anchor content, if you will, to you know, virtual internet channels that may aggregate you know, multiple you know, consumer-related podcasting along a single uh, single content vertical? Sort of like a cable channel. <laughs> well, like a virtual cable channel. But, you know, if you have a, if you have a, if you have a, you know, I mean, Jay, you have Big Nation, right? Is that That's right. right? You do two hundred thousand, whatever. Viewers or show or whatever it is, you know that could be an anchor tenant on a tech channel, for example. If you aggregated, you know, a dozen other uh, like web logs, but you know, kind of model. If you aggregated a dozen other podcasters who were like 
content, you know, maybe now you're at, you now you, now you, you grow the audience from 200,000 to mm -hmm. two and a half million or something. One and a half, actually. Well, one and a half, thank you. Um, but I mean, I, I would just see that there's an opportunity for, if you have good anchor content, to create these kind of virtual channels that aggregate, you know, advertising. It's, it is, but it is hard to sell, even in a niche. I mean, it's actually harder to sell, to some extent. Um, you know, we partnered a little bit with Federated Media, who was doing web ads for Dig, and they started taking orders because they were good at selling along that vertical of tech. They started taking orders selling ads um, on Revision 3 content, which was tricky um, at first because, you know, it's a different type of sale and uh, in tracking issues. Everything that we've been talking about is an issue with that. But, but I mean, essentially, that is what, that is why Revision 3 got developed, was exactly the evolution you just described. We had an anchor, so it really what technically wasn't Dignation first, but um, now we have 12 shows. And now they're not all tech, but, but, there's a, but the verticals aren't necessarily the content themselves, it's really the demographic or the culture of, of your particular audience. It's an audience overlap that I have. Yeah. But I mean, you go to AP and they've got sports, you know, they got sports content, they've got all kinds of, <coughs> kinds of content you can imagine you know, creating it together. You know, There's an issue with uh, not cannibalizing yourself as well right now. If you distribute your content um, and all of a sudden you decrease the value it doesn't work out. So people are very uh, susceptible right now to, to figuring this out before they actually just blast the internet with new partnerships and syndication uh, partnerships. Um, it comes down to having the tracking basically to make it, to validate any partnership that you have in place and to test it out before you go large. Yeah, that's our problem. Yeah, it's so because actually, you know, a classic example of that is BitTorrent. No one's mentioned BitTorrent today. Which is by the way a big, successful, advertising-friendly distribution channel for us right now because we're seeding it. Um, and there's a secondary distribution that happens with downloading content. And so if I don't know, so so what would happen is somebody would call up. We have a thing where if you subscribe and you pay, you can get it a couple days early. That sort of thing, you know, direct. Um, and so it would download it and then put up their own BitTorrent so that people could get it two days early. And you know, at first we, we, were, we were lost control of our content, we were upset about it, and then we realized, well, as long as we get the tracker information, mm -hmm. I'm gonna, there's no one else tracking it yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm fine with that as long as they give me that information back. Mm -hmm. And so we've given that to the uh, advertisers. They've been welcoming that data from us for now. Right. Because that's all there is. Because that's all there is. Right. Until now. Until now. Okay, that's time. <laughs> <laughs> that's time. Uh, thank you all for attending, and thanks to all the panel members.